Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rudo Kemper. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be sharing with you today. I'm going to be presenting on some work uh, that we've been doing on creating an open source tool to map and safeguard indigenous oral histories. So uh, to start with a little bit about myself, um, I'm a geographer and a technologist with uh, an organization called Digital Democracy, which works with uh, communities to leverage technologies to um, solve pressing challenges and to defend lands. I'm originally from Curaçao, uh, but I'm living in the DC area and my heart beats for South America and I'm really excited to be sharing with you uh, today. So what I'd like to do is start with a little bit of work um, that I've been doing in the past five years with a different organization called the Amazon Conservation Team doing indigenous mapping work with communities in South America. And then I'd like to tell you about an application that came out of that work, which is called Terra Stories. So I'd like to start with this really um, beautiful and impressive map that was produced actually I believe it was in 1998 by the guy who's holding it. His name is Wuta Wanyamu. He's from the south of Suriname. And this was one of the first maps that was produced of his landscape, which is uh, the Terreno people. And this is an area of about 2.5 million hectares. And what was happening at the time was the community was experiencing a lot of outsiders coming in and different sort of uh, visitors from the government and different organizations that wanted to do work there. And so the chieftain of his community decided that it was important to start having maps that showed what the community, what the area looked like from their point of view, because when you look at the government's maps or Google maps, you only see either empty names or colonial place names. So the, uh, the chieftain decided to conscript Wuta and others to help make these indigenous maps, which are uh, just really kind of impressive in terms of the technology that was used. It was all hand drawn. And so Wuta sat down with elders in his community and time and time verified the information and validated everything and just navigating the rivers in his mind. And what you have on here are sacred sites, historical places, uh, traditional knowledge, natural resources, medicines, all kinds of really um, incredible information that's depicted on this map. So one of the first things that ACT did in the history of the organization was to digitize some of those maps um, and put them into GIS format at the time in 2001, 2003. And these maps were used in uh, negotiations for lands, for demarcation, and are actually still being used today in negotiations with the government in terms of um, the demarcation of the indigenous lands. So these were very useful for political purposes, um, but they're also really interesting just in terms of history and storytelling. And so what you're seeing here is I'm blurring the map intentionally because it's community uh, data, so I don't have permission to share it. But there's a lot of rich detail and stories that are mapped on these different indigenous maps. And, but it's a little hard to sort of see it just by looking at the points, right? And these were maps that were produced in 2001, so there wasn't really a means to um, add storytelling content. But there was a number of places on these maps that have really quite a lot of um, significant uh, spiritual and sacred value to the communities. And this is one example this is from Google Maps. This is a Tepui, which is a granite mountain called Samuaka, that is incredibly sacred for this community. And so at the time, ACT um, did what they could, which is that they produced a publication about it, kind of talking about the importance of land use mapping and why history is so embedded in this community's understanding of the landscape and really kind of crucial you know, to their identity, their self-identity and why they relate to their lands. Um, and that was the best that they could do at the time in terms of the technologies and the means that were available. Um, and you know, ACT wasn't the only organization that came to this realization about the importance of history for mapping and to sort of thinking about storytelling. And I think frequently all of us who are cartographers can probably relate to this in terms of the amount of story that comes out of the map making process, right? And this is uh, some quotes on the screen here from a really just beautiful, excellent documentary about the mapping that was done by a North American indigenous community you know, where he's talking about how important the stories are, much more important, actually, the stories about the lands, that the place names are important, but, you know, um, the storytelling aspect that comes out of it is really something vital and life-affirming, community-affirming. So about five years ago, I did some mapping work with a community in Suriname called the Maroons, which are Afro-descendants uh, that have lived there for the past 300 years, fought for their right to, to live there and still have a very vibrant uh, traditional culture. And the community, kind of similar to what was going on with Wuta, the indigenous man who I showed you earlier, was in need of maps about land use to kind of communicate with outsiders. And so ACT was involved in doing some of that work with uh, the community. And one of the things that we realized, this is me sitting on the boat here with an elder, um, and I also took this picture of the lady in the bottom right, 
is again, this, this sort of storytelling aspect that as soon as you start doing mapping, there's a tremendous amount of story that comes out of that process. And you really realize that the oral histories that the communities that this one, for example, has about the place where they live and their territory is really just as important, right? As the information that we tend to put on maps, which tends to be toponyms, place names, and th things like that. So we decided to do something a little bit different and it's kind of along the same vein as what we did, in, the organization did in 2001, which is to figure out a way to kind of capture some of those narratives and stories about the places. Uh, we worked with some of the youth in the community to record the elders telling stories. This was obviously with the democratization of technology, it's easier to work with video recording equipment and audio recorders, and you can involve the youth a lot more in the process and make it more participatory. Um, which is great, but we wanted to go one step further, which is to now think about interactive maps and all the technologies that we have available today to connect the stories more closely with the maps that we were producing, right? Because we could produce maps like this one here on the screen, which is a territory map for the Matawai, which, is, which features over 700 place names. And we try to put kind of Nat Geo style, a few of the stories next to the places, but we wanted to feature more actively the voices of the elders and the community in their own way of, of relating stories and to basically have the stories be literally put on the map. Um, so, you know, you have really wonderful technologies out there um, already, such as Esri's story map template. We're about to publish this one on Friday, which is about the oral history of this community, which is really great at using maps to tell stories. But it's not quite the same as mapping stories, if you know what I mean. And the other uh, really important limitation of these kinds of platforms is that they tend to rely on internet access. And where we're working in the Amazon, um, there's no internet access or it's prohibitively expensive. And the communities want to be able to view the stories right there in the village, in the rainforest. So we decided to do something a little bit different, which was to develop a software, an open source software um, that's dedicated to the specific needs, the specific need, which is to map oral histories. And we bore into mind several requirements that um, were important to us, which is again, the offline and online compatibility needs to be able to work offline as well as online. Uh, the need for custom base maps, because as I already mentioned, uh, most of the maps that are publicly out there don't have the same information that the communities have, or there might be things that they want to put on their maps, but don't want to share on a platform like OpenStreetMap. Um, we wanted an easy interface where you could easily um, explore the lands and sort of see videos about the different uh, places. And we wanted to be able to give the community the control to, um, the ability to control who views the points and who views the stories. So, if there's restricted stories that are about a spiritual place or a historical place that should only be shared with community members and nobody else, it's kind of internal knowledge, they should have the ability to uh, control that. And of course, ability to stream audio content, videos, and free and open source. That was really crucial to us as well because we kept hearing from all over the world similar kinds of needs in Canada, in Kenya, and different places. So we wanted it to be free and open source. So out of that, Terror Stories was born, which is a um, application that I am I'm involved in stewarding along with a few other folks. And basically the way that it works is that you've got several ingredients. You've got your map, which um, in this case can be designed in Mapbox Studio, or it can be put into GeoJSON format. You've got your audio visual content and then the Terror Stories download. And from that, you can combine these three to create an instance of Terror Stories that's spun up for a community. And start applying the process. So I'll give you a little tour in terms of how it works. So it can be translated to any language. That's a language picker um, that you see at the entry, the welcome screen here. So we also wanted to make it fully translatable for any communities so that you're not reliant on Western languages. And then from there, you can start to populate some of the visual assets like the background and the logos. But most importantly, you have, of course, your maps and your stories. And that's the, uh, the primary function of the application and the, and the primary view. So you've got your custom maps, and this is something that can work offline using a tile server or online using Mapbox Studio. And then the way that it works is that you've got points on the map that when you click on the points, it filters uh, the stories that are in the sidebar that are related to the place. Or you could also click on one of the stories in the sidebar, and then it travels to the place. So it has kind of a dual functionality in terms of the pedagogy about the land. And then you can also use filters, which is at the top left there to be able to um, filter per region or by speaker or by indigenous taxonomies. And this is something that the communities themselves can all design and set up via backend. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also set certain stories as either restricted or for anonymous so that if you're just anybody coming into this instance of terror stories, there's certain stories you can view, but there's other ones that are only viewable once you've logged in, like if you're a community member or an administrator. 
Uh, we designed it to be, we're thinking about the kids, especially, you know, that's a big concern with the communities is that the transmission of knowledge isn't happening in the same way. You know, in the 21st century, even in the rainforest, kids have cell phones and they're busy and thinking about other stuff and they don't want to sit around and listen to their elders. So we made it intentionally to be very user friendly and fun to play with so that for the kids, it's a great way for them to learn about um, their culture and their history. And the teachers in the schools uh, sort of really love this and have gravitated towards this because it combines a lot of different things at the same time. It's computer skills, as well as language, as well as geography, um, history, of course. So it's a really kind of useful resource for, for reaching the kids and, and providing a means that really speaks to their worldview and their cosmovision. So just a quick slideshow of a few other instances uh, that we spun up for different communities. This is with a community in Brazil in the Xingu called Uluquene. And we recently did a very fun kind of, uh, in the, you know, the kind of Zoom remote context that we all live in, we did some live mapping with um, Chief Arvo Looking Horse from the Lakota community, where we were on a live podcast and in so doing, creating Terra stories, um, using some Lakota traditional knowledge there in the South and North Dakota. So um, just a quick summary of Terra stories. As I mentioned, it's free and open source. We do have a methodology that we designed as well to sort of how to, how to actually do this work with communities and recording oral histories and suggestions on kits and things like that, uh, best practices. Um, it works entirely offline and online. It's entirely translatable and it's designed for really just any community. We've talked about indigenous and forest peoples, but it can be used by any community, you know, to map their stories about their lands. And, you know, we're in talks with somebody that wants to use it for Celtic archaeology and oral history, which is really interesting as well for lots of different um, use cases. Uh, just some thing, quick things that we're working on and, and struggling with as well. So if anybody has any thoughts and ideas, um, we do have a very welcoming open source developer community if anybody's interested. So just ease of installation, making it as off the shelf ready as possible. Uh, there's a lot of concerns, of course, about sensitive data and how to ensure that it gets safely backed up peer-to-peer uh, -peer and instance thinking. That's something we're working on with digital democracy. And um, we're working on a curriculum builder where teachers can easily create their own curricula using the stories that are populated with. And last but not least, um, at digital democracy, we're working on creating something that we're calling Earth Defenders Toolkit, which is going to be kind of a toolkit of, or a platform of different value-aligned open source softwares, which will include Terra Stories, as well as uh, Digital Democracy's Mapeo and some others. That is going to be basically a platform of where we provide different uh, user-friendly manuals, how the tools work together, um, and kind of make them as accessible and user-friendly as possible. So stay tuned for that. That's something that we're working on um, these months, and we should have something ready to launch by um, November for that as well. And that's what I have to share with you for today. So thanks very much for your attention, and I look forward to talking with you in chat. Thank you so much, Rudo. Uh, Definitely check out the chat. There's comments and uh, other resources, ideas coming through. Um, one of the first questions that just came up comes from Tesla Dubois. And it says, or uh, this is really interesting. Have you had any concerns come up with protecting individuals' data, like in terms of connecting people's stories with where they live? Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so this was one of the central concerns that we had in mind in building this application is the complete sovereignty over the data and control that the community has. Uh, this is something that's really important for Amazonian communities that are very concerned about um, data extractivism and have had a lot of experiences in the past with outsiders coming in. So when we talk about extractivism, we don't just mean resources, but it can also be knowledge and stories, right? And even academics that build their career off of extracting data. Um, so that was something that we bore very centrally in, in creating the software is in giving the communities as much control as possible. And so for that reason, we have the ability to kind of control what stories get shared and seen by different individuals. Um, so the communities are able to create those settings and in that way protect their data. In some cases, they want to share stories and they want to, the world to know that they exist, that they are on the map, uh, because when you go on a standard map, you don't see them. Um, but then they still want to protect certain stories. So that's part of the mechanism that we bore in mind is and very much inspired by principles of um, indigenous data sovereignty that I know uh, Anita who's speaking after me is also very involved in. That's great. I think, uh, I think that's just so important, almost like structured flexibility when it comes to the tools that we make that how can we adapt simultaneously and connect people. Um, another question that just came up was, how do you make contacts with and gain trust of local indigenous communities? Um, what is that process like? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? 
Oh yeah. Uh, how do you make contacts with and gain trust of local indigenous groups that you're working with? Got it. Um, so in all of these cases, there's, there was a prior relationship that the organization had. Um, ACT and, and digital democracy as well um, doesn't work with any um, community unless they're invited to work there. So there's usually uh, somebody from the community reaching out, either heard from a different community that there's um, organizations available to help with this kind of work. Um, in terms of gaining trust, for example, with the Matawai project, I was very involved from the very beginning. And there was some initial apprehension around both the mapping work and then later the storytelling work because community members, some people weren't sure why we were doing this, were we sharing this with outsiders, are we with the government control, uh, capturing stories? Um, and really the way to kind of overcome that is with any kind of project like this where you just build relationships, right? And it's about long-term engagement and coming back especially, which can be difficult with some um, Amazonian communities because it can be very expensive to fly there. So chartering a plane and things like that where there's no internet access. But it's really vital to really show that you're committed and that you're not somebody who's there just for a few months gathering stuff and then never coming back. Is if you keep coming back with the maps and you keep validating the knowledge and the information, that really shows people that you're in this for them and that you're supporting them primarily and that's your mission. So it's a it's a long process. It can take a lot of time. These projects don't aren't accomplished in just a few months. You know, this is a combination of uh, several years of work with the Matawai, for example. So that's part and parcel of the work. Sounds great. I think that's definitely a takeaway for all of us that uh, often the, the really good work takes time and relationship building. Um, with that, we should probably move on, but thank you so much. Everyone in the Slack channel, feel free to keep adding comments. Uh, Rudo, I'm sure we'll filter through those later on.